recording. All right, welcome everybody to the November 16th Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. Uh, I think all of you have been on the call before, um, but just as a reminder, two things that we have to abide by. The first is the antitrust policy uh, that is currently displayed on the screen. And the second is our code of conduct, which is linked in the agenda. For announcements today, we have the Hyperledger Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter that goes out each Friday. If you would like to include anything in that newsletter, please do leave a comment on the wiki page that is linked in the agenda. The second announcement is that today there is a workshop. Um, I think it happens two hours after this call. If I get my, no, an hour after this call, I think it is. Um, so if you still do want to attend, uh, please do click and register and attend the meeting or the workshop on atomic cross ledger transactions between Hyperledger Basu and Corda ledgers using Hyperledger Cacti V2. And um, I feel like there was another announcement I was supposed to make, but I cannot remember what it is and I did not write it down. So maybe somebody else might have an announcement and I can think about what that was that I wanted to say. I have nothing. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Well, the other thing that I think I wanted to say didn't come to me either. So maybe it will come to me later. It will, um, I'll let you guys know what it was. Uh, the um, Maybe there's, the, that there's no meeting next week? That's probably what it was. That is probably what it was um, because that went through my head this morning. So um, yes, there is no meeting next week. Just as a reminder, we are canceling because next week it is Thanksgiving here in the U.S. And uh, so there's a number of people who will not be on the call anyway. So we canceled the meeting. Thanks, Rai. Uh, quarterly reports. So for quarterly reports, we have the same reports on the um, calendar or on the agenda that we had last year, last week. Jeez, where is my brain this morning? Um, and... Uh, I don't think there, there's any new comments that have come out that I have seen, but if there's any comments or questions that anybody would like to bring up now, now is your time to do so. Okay, so we did get the uh, Hyperledger bubble that report that came in last evening. So if you haven't had a chance to look at that, I know I have not, um, please do have a look at the, the Bevel um, report and provide your comments and feedback to that. And then uh, for next week, we have do the Solang and the Transact report. Um, as uh, you may recall, the Transact uh, maintainers have not submitted a report for the last two quarters um, because they have been moving the code into Sawtooth. So we will probably want to check in with the Transact maintainers and see where they're at, if they're ready to move the project to an end of life state or or not. Um, so yeah, just uh, I'd like to keep that on the agenda just so that we remember that we need, need to have a conversation with them every quarter. All right, any questions on the, the quarterly reports? Okay, so we do have two discussion items today. Uh, the first one is um, maintainer events for 2024. The second is our badging lifecycle task force. Uh, so for the first item on our discussion, uh, wanted to have a conversation with the, the folks here on the TOC to talk about, you know, desire to have events for maintainers in 2024, what those events might look like, I know we had um, some past discussions in the TOC about maintainer events, but I think we were still in kind of the COVID phase of, of life. So um, now that we're kind of moved beyond that, wanted to see kind of what people have ideas around what they would like to see done in 2024. This will obviously help the staff 
as they put together their planning for 2024 to make sure that we um, can satisfy the needs of the maintainers. So any thoughts or ideas from anybody on the TOC about the sorts of things that they would like to see, um, the sorts of things that they thought were was uh, useful from past maintainer events that they've been involved in, or um, yeah, it just really any ideas that you might have is what we're looking for at this point. So these are, just to be clear, these are events of groups of maintainers across the project. Is that what you mean? Yes. So uh, in the past, we've had two different types of maintainer events that have occurred at uh, the Hyperledger Foundation. Uh, in the early days, we used to have what we called Hackfest. Um, those were open to more than just maintainers. Uh, they were, they ended up having a lot of new folks involved, but they were on conference style where the maintainers could get together, discuss whatever it was that they wanted, very similar to IIW, Stephen, in yeah. the way that those things happened. Um, and then the, the last type of event that we had for maintainers, they were called maintainer summits. Um, and they were more closed um, as far as the attendees to, to really just maintainers. And the discussions there were twofold. Uh, we did have... Um, kind of that on conference style, but we also had a bit of specific driven content where we would uh, make sure that the maintainers across different projects knew about each other, um, you know, knew what the other projects were doing in case there was any sort of collaboration that could happen. And then obviously, you know, there's also the events that happen like the Indie Summit or the Aries Summit and, and things like that. Um, that haven't necessarily been open to everyone. Uh, and so, yeah, I think the, the question is, do you like any of those type of events? Are there specific things that you would like to see out of events containing maintainers for the Hyperledger community? Um, you know, just any sort of ideas of, of things that might work for you as, in, as a maintainer, as an individual, or things that you think might work for your projects that you're involved in? So... Yeah, I think at this point, just really looking for different ideas about things that might occur in 2024 to, to help with the, the community and specifically the maintainer community. Yeah, I think um, one, one part of it is could definitely be sort of low effort, high reward um, things that projects have found. So things like the... Um, you know, walking through how you can do a make doc site to get much better documentation, um, samples of, you know, good getting started material and and um, tutorial things, CI/CD things that that people have found. So sort of leave it open. But the idea would be things that we've discovered um, that that proved valuable. Um, and here's how we did them, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, great. Kind of a sort of a learning event for the best practices that the different projects exactly. have discovered. Yeah. Which is the same thing we've talked about through this a lot of this year, best practices for automated pipelines, best practices for documentation and 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 things like that. And then with that, um the tools that you know, making sure all the maintainers and all the projects are aware of the tools that um, Hyperledger has. I mean, there's there's a ton of things and it's hard to know all of them. So I think that's a, another good topic, a summary of those. So those are just sort of general interest ones. The other one would be um, uh, overviews of the projects maybe, or some of the lesser known projects and, and how, you know, to, with that idea of, of leading toward a um, collaboration across projects, I don't know how much that's needed. Um, I've, <laughs> I've not been participated in such things, so I don't know, but it sounds like that has in the past. Yeah, definitely in the, in the early days, I think there was a lot of that. Um, yeah. I, I don't know that we're doing 
uh, as much as we used to. Um, probably a lot of the uh, the virtual events that are happening are, you know, potentially a little bit deeper dive instead of high level reviews. But uh, yeah, there's there's probably some some stuff there. So for the the first sort of idea that you had with the the learning events. You think that's better done in person, virtual, hybrid? What what's your your thought on that sort of thing? Um, I, I think I would do it as either a um, a maintainer's event uh, where we put together a a uh, an agenda, but do it remote or at most tied to some other event. I don't think you could have an in-person for that purpose. I don't think that would be a mm -hmm. powerful enough draw. Um, but I think it could be, you know, a, a, a three-hour session, you know, a, a full a, a full chunk of day, because you never know what time of day it, it would be, but um, chunk of day type where you have a series of of presentations or 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 discussions. Okay, great. Thanks, That's Stephen. What yeah, Marcus. Yeah, so I, if I remember correctly, I think I attended uh, the Hackfest in Amsterdam and also the maintainer meeting. It was either in Toronto or Montreal. I don't remember. Um, but I think both events were great. I mean, meeting uh, so many people, you are, I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, just interact uh, via Discord or or Slack or whatever we used back then. I think this was, uh, for many people, such a great experience to to meet the people in, in, in person. And I absolutely see big value in that and I, I, yeah, I mean, the last few years, we did a lot of remote uh, conference style, which I personally hate, but this is only my personal opinion here. Uh, so I would really uh, love to see the people uh, again in person. And I mean, have whiteboard sessions, have discussions during lunch, during dinner, having beers together to basically, I mean, I mean build a good foundation um, people can actually work on. I mean, also having fun together, right? And uh, I don't know, I think, I mean, a hybrid model of this Hackfest and Maintainer uh, Summit would be nice. So for the Hackfest, make it open so that also users uh, or potential new maintainers could come and uh, learn about, um, I don't know, the core technologies or the, the, uh, the core code um, um, of the different projects, but also give the maintainers room to uh, sit together and basically, I mean, discuss things um, which is maybe much easier to discuss in person and uh, things get resolved in uh, in a one hour slot rather than discussing it in a form in over two weeks, something like that. So if if uh, such a yeah event could happen in person, I would definitely uh, would like that. Great. Thanks, Marcus. Yeah, I, I completely agree, right? Seeing people face-to-face, -face, interacting that, with them in a different manner uh, does bring a different sort of connection to the, the people that you've been working with closely anyway, right? Um, so appreciate the, the thoughts there, Marcus. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you see the benefits, the actual benefits of such a meeting uh, after, I don't know, or the, the, the first few weeks after such an event. Because then you start collaborating with the people again using our usual tools, and then you notice, okay, it becomes for some reason much easier now to collaborate. Yeah, yeah, probably because you've seen that person and know who they are at a, a deeper level than you did uh, surface wise with the uh, Discord communication. All right, thank you, Marcus. Bobby? Hi. Um... So uh, again, I didn't run for the TSC next year, TOC next year. So I'm just giving my two cents for whatever it's worth for everybody. But it's I definitely honestly, worth something, Bobby. Thank you. <laughs> I honestly <laughs> do believe in the power of face-to-face -face meetings, but in this day and age, those are far and few between and very special. Um, I believe in the interim that I am again the hugest proponent for that metaverse library. It has 
all the information logically set up, open 24 seven. It can be done in different languages. It can be done, you know, meeting spaces for maintainers with their information. They can go whenever they want. So again, I believe that this community has such important information and just to make it accessible for people when they need it, I think is where we should go in the future. And my second thing is I do believe in the badging process and I think it should be gamified learning. Um, I think we have enough information. I think we have more information um, that that gamified learning um, would challenge people to, you know, maybe you get something if you learn about three projects instead of just one or, you know, whatever. So I, I do believe that we could step it up again, like uh, Stephen said, with the learning section of this and getting the information where it needs to be. So thank you for letting me speak. Yeah, thank you, Bobby. And uh, Bobby, just because you brought it up, uh, you are going to be missed next year and your voice on the TOC. I do hope that you can attend at least some of the meetings. Uh, you know, obviously, even though you're not on the TOC doesn't mean you can't be here. So um, please don't hesitate to bring your voice to the community. Well, I intend to definitely keep that Hyperledger library uh, operating in the metaverse. And the only way I can be effective of that is if I know what's going on. So you haven't heard the Great. last <laughs> Perfect. Very, very good. Very good. All right. Any other thoughts or ideas about things that you would like to see out of the events from 2024? David, Sean, Rai, any particular questions that you have uh, that uh, you might not have been already talked about or, or things that you'd like to, to see if the, the group might be interested? I think my main question was the one you already asked about, you know, if you would want to do this in person and if so, you know, what would be compelling? And I think, you know, people have touched on this, but if we did do an in-person one, what, what would it need to include to really compel uh, you know, people to go to it. And it sounds like there's definitely a desire for in-person is what I heard. Um, mm -hmm. And then just, you know, the details. It sounds like maybe we need to do this attached to something else because maybe there's not enough draw for it a standalone. So that that just sort of, uh, um, you know, is very helpful for our planning to know, to know what would it be, uh, what would it need to look like for people to, you know, show up and attend yeah and if anybody has any ideas of the sorts of things that it could be attached to yeah um, exactly. well that yeah that's that, a good that one might too. be useful to to have attached to is um, there an event we're all planning to be at next year right well i guess for many people uh, we need some kind of business justification to travel these times uh Mm -hmm. I mean, if the toc for instance would say okay we do the end of the year project review in person at a maintainer summit and that would be kind of uh, increasing pressure yeah i mean that's a good point mark because i mean it's one thing for you to want to go but it's another thing for you to get approval internally to go i guess yeah so there's two layers there so yeah what would make it compelling for you to want to go and then what would make it you know justifiable internally to get signed off for right rama uh, just wondered if there's going to be a global forum next year because there wasn't one this year. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I don't actually know the details myself either. You know, I think as Tracy had said, we're in the we're kicking off the 2024 planning process, and that has not been finalized. So I I don't know the answer. I think maybe one thing we can do either sometime in December or very early January is come back you know, and report back what our 2024 planning, you know, is so that everybody here is in the loop and we, you know, stay coordinated about, you know, what the TOC is planning for next year and what the staff is planning for next year. So, you know, we're happy to do that. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, this also in response to Marcus's question, a global forum is the kind of thing we might get uh, approval for. Yeah. Yeah. So as far, as far as Global Forum is going, yeah, again, I think we can report back on that maybe in a few weeks or, or very early January. Um, and then, yeah, if that's a compelling 
time to plan for this, or if it's not, then we could find something else. But the problem I see with the global forum is that this is, I mean, a conference style. And uh, I mean, people maybe think, okay, they need to present in order to participate there. I mean, for maintainers in particular. Um, and then many companies have the policy, okay, you can only go to conference if you present something. Um, but there, I don't know, maybe then the global forum can... Uh, the next edition of the global forum could also have a let's say let's say maintainer summit included where we do some reporting on projects something like that in order to i mean trigger really everyone uh, wants to come to the global forum and that, i mean the global forum has a another interest, interesting aspect that it um, connects the community with potential clients or more end users uh, from different industries so this is for the companies, I guess, also a very interesting thing. Yeah, Marcus, I think that's a, it's an interesting point, right? Um, I think if you think about the the early half fest that we had, you know, some of the, the concerns there was that the maintainers wanted to actually do some work and get some something accomplished. And sometimes when you had the the users or the, the newbies, right, showing up, um, the first thing that you needed to do was obviously educate people about what the projects were. Um, but at the same time, those events gave us the opportunity to cross paths with people who wanted to use it or potential clients, right? Which obviously is a um, a compelling reason for businesses to want to send their, uh, you know, their maintainers to these different events. So I think, you know, David, um, kind of the, the thinking there would be, there's got to be a reason that businesses want to send the maintainers to an event and what yeah. could those reasons be? And we could maybe do some brainstorming about that sort of thing. I wonder, maybe this is not the time to do the brainstorming, but I wonder if maybe doing a multi-part thing would maybe, it seems like the workshops were really compelling at Global Forum in Dublin, and that would be maybe, you know, that compelling reason you're you're on the agenda to give a workshop and then people maybe even new people we could open that up to new people new people want to go to that workshop and then before or after those series of workshops maybe we do the maintainer only part so that's my thought on brainstorming for a compelling reason mm -hmm. yeah i i agree um i thought one uh i hate to say recent um but the event that we had in Basel was uh, really good. Uh, you know, it had the, the right mix of uh, the member summit was there. The, uh, you know, we had the global forum and it was, uh, we had a, a big boff area, right? So you, if you were interested in fabric, you could go sit at the fabric table. Um, it was, it was really nice. So kind of that multi-part event where you know it's more open to the public on a couple days and then or on a, a single day and then the maintainers have like two days where it's more gated um i think that would be really great cool. thanks Roy. any other thoughts on this topic before we move forward All right, well, I'm sure this isn't the last time that we'll be talking about events for 2024 and what those look like, um, but it, it was, a, uh, hopefully it was useful, David, um, Sean, Rai, to get some initial thoughts on this. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for adding it to the agenda. Yep. All right, uh, so the next item on the agenda is the uh, task force discussion on the badging life cycle. Uh, Rama, I think this is off to you now. Thanks, Tracy. So, uh, I had mentioned last week that I would uh, have a document for people to vote on. Uh, fortunately, I haven't quite finished it yet. So I have made uh, I have something to to show you. Uh, let me just uh, show you what I have, and I also want to discuss a couple of things. And uh, uh, I I can finish the document pretty soon, and uh, then we can go about the voting process. That's it.
but uh, I see your screen, right? Yes. So, <clears throat> one a bit of cough. Uh, so uh, I thought it would be best to uh, put this into the TFT repository. So I uh, created a file in the government document folder called uh, project badging. This is in my fork at this point. Um, ignore this this part. This just uh, notes which I'll remove. Uh, I'm going. I have a list of uh, different badges and uh, um, classified into these are very unimaginative names. So if you have different name suggestion, I'm open to it. Just calling them life cycle tackle badges and quality indicator badges. Uh, just to show you what which ones I'm referring to. Let me go to the yeah. So uh, I mean here we call, we call them mandatory and optional, but that doesn't really describe the badges. I mean uh, it's not mandatory to have a badge. It's just that the badges we listed here are the ones which are relevant to uh, a project's uh, life cycle uh, state transition decision, whereas these badges are not. But uh, both these badges are uh, both these kind of badges are uh, good to have and important to have. So uh, that's what I'm calling them uh, again. If you have any suggestions for what you should call them uh, in place of this, open to it. Uh, and uh, I will uh, I will put list them, and uh, that's an easy task. I just haven't got on to it. Uh, I made this uh, slightly different diagram because what I was trying to do with this was uh, try and figure out if we had covered all the state transitions in the uh, in the life cycle. And uh, the diagram by itself, by the way, I added another arrow which I showed in the the last time I covered this topic. Uh, maybe that was I think three weeks ago or something, uh, which is uh, an arrow from graduate to incubation. Uh, note that the let me just go to the Yeah, the life cycle the original diagram does not have that arrow from graduated incubation. But during the discussions on the, the badging task force, we determined that it would be good to have such a transition. So uh, I added one. That's the only one added. And then there's also this sort of a, a dash arrow that just comes into the proposal stage, which is just uh, how. It's like the bare minimum qualification for any project to be accepted as a proposal. Uh, so I count I counted uh, here, uh, 14, uh, 14 arrows, and uh, the the collection criteria collection bucket. Each of these symbol is is a is a badge. Uh, and, uh, the green indicates the acquisition of a badge uh, or or the uh, going from a badge. Um, in one stage to another, that is, uh, say you have a the decentralization badge, uh, we'll have like two two parts to it. One is it's either a two plus or a three plus, uh, which means we are okay with the project being maintained by uh, up to two companies, uh, or up to two institutions, as long as the incubation stage. But we need at least three for the graduate stage. So that's uh, that's the decentralized badge. We may just call refer to them as separate badge when we formally uh, accept this. Uh, the red uh, uh, boxes just indicate the withdrawal of a particular badge because the criteria for the badge is uh, uh, the project is not meeting the criteria for that particular badge. Uh, and then, as you can see, I uh, tried to uh, uh, put the numbers in the different boxes. And uh, of course, you can review this. I what I wanted to just uh, discuss at this point uh, was uh, that. I was able to fit in all the numbers except for 8 and 11. Uh, what are 8 and 11? 8 is the arrow going from incubation to end of life, and 11 is the arrow going from graduation to end of life. So uh, it doesn't fit any of these because uh, when we were discussing the project life cycle, we were always thinking about uh, what should happen to a, a project that's in an incubated or graduated stage. Should it fail to meet particular criteria? And we were always thinking about, OK, maybe it should go into the dormant stage or to the deprecated stage. Uh, it seems rather drastic to move them directly to end of life, uh, but maybe there's a good reason for that. So I just wanted to ask uh, if anybody remembers what, uh, like Clover was part of creating this diagram in the first place. Uh, what do you think was the criteria to move from incubation of graduates directly to end of life? Uh, and if you can't think of any criteria, maybe we should remove those arrows uh, and just have the 
extra step before the project is full time applied? Uh, sorry, I don't see any. Uh, yeah, so maybe, yeah. sorry, I didn't raise my hand. Maybe one of the things that uh, we could think about here is just, um, let's say that you've got a project, it does uh, something, right? Let's just call that X. Uh, and then another project comes along that also does X, but does it better. And you're like, well, let's just move our work over to that or let's, um, let's say that the um, this project shouldn't be used anymore in favor of this other project that does whatever we were doing much better. Um, that could be a, one reason that you might move straight from an incubation or a graduated to an end of life. Um, you know, it could be that uh, the maintainers are going away and they don't have any plans to maintain the project moving forward. Right, so they're not even going to maintain security issues, or they're not going to um, do any sort of bug maintenance that would be probably required in the dormant and the deprecated um, phases. Right, the dormant phase I think says that um, we're going away, but we're still going to be, uh, you know, doing like the security bug fixes. I think the deprecated one is. We are. We know that we're, this is headed towards end of life, and the end of life it, we going to say is in six months or a year, or whatever that number is, and and so uh, you know, therefore we're going to do that. But if the maintainers have completely gone away and there's nobody to come pick it up, um, then it would it should go directly to an end of life state. And I think we've had a couple of those um, projects where we've sent directly from incubation to end of life, whether or not we've had any that have gone from graduated to end of life, I don't think we have. Um, I think most graduated projects have either gone to dormant or deprecated before they go to end of life. But uh, yeah, I do think that there is at least a, a potential, right, that that line should exist. But it, it really has more to do with the fact that there's, um, you know, either something better that's come along. Um, that can replace it or that the maintainers have completely gone away. Got it. No, that makes a lot of sense. I wasn't actually thinking about a project that just uh, for which there was good reason to just end it because of uh, either replacement or because nobody was wanted to do anything uh, more, anything useful. Uh, I think then, uh, yeah, I mean, this isn't even a badging criteria. I mean, at that point, it's, it's sort of, I think it would be clear to everybody that the project needs to move to EOL. I guess the the badge that we mount is top level versus labs. That uh, having a top level badge, we can just say with all top level badge means either an incubated project in incubated stage or a graduate graduate stage of the plan. So just just to to complete the picture. Does that make sense? No, I think that makes sense. Cool. Right. Anybody? Hello. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a bit of sidetracking maybe, but, you know, when I was looking at this, I thought, man, this is really complicated. And, <laughs> and you know, I went back yeah. to the wiki page of this task force, which had this parallel graph of, you know, the life cycle we have and the one that exists for LF networking. And I, I think... There are two aspects to this. First, by calling end of life, end of life, we made it like sound like it's not recoverable, <laughs> at least in this yeah. world. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it's, I just went through this with the open SSF, so it's quite familiar to me. If instead it were, it were called uh, archived, then that's not necessarily an an absolute end, right? You can recover from archive by unarchiving. And so I think we have created deprecated and dormant because it seemed so lethal, literally, to go to end of life that we will need to be very cautious about it and not call it too soon. But maybe there is a simple way to simplify this to rename end of life to archive, and then we can probably, you know, simplify this graph, get rid of dormant and deprecated, because then you can. There's no real harm to going to archival, 
even if it's temporary or not. Yeah, but, no, no, sorry, I I know, in the, yeah, sorry, go on. No, I, I realize this is not probably about badging, but I think this graphic really is, illustrates the complexity of a life cycle. And I think, you know, we should also consider, you know, possibility of simplifying this. No, thanks. All, everything you said make, makes sense. I mean, we, we did uh, discuss, I mean, if you go to the uh, first uh, document I, I created in the project badging life cycle, we, uh, I, I tried to raise these points. I was uh, asking about, inquiring about whether we need all these states and these sort of complex diagrams and also the end of life, as you, as you mentioned, um, uh, yeah, the LF uh, graph just as an archive. Maybe we can call it suspension of life. I don't know. I mean, I was asking this question about whether we should have an arrow from from this stage, whatever we call it, back to the proposal. Uh, Tracy. Yeah, no, I I like I like this idea, Arno, um, that you have around kind of combining these three states, if you will, into uh, like an archive state. Um, I do think that it will make things easier, not only in this life cycle. But also, uh, as we think about these badges and, and the transitions between them, right? Um, I think we see a lot of things on this, uh, like four and six, right? If you think about four and six, they could very well be, um, well, I guess they'll still be four and six. But um, I think there's ways to go from that archive back to an incubation state. Um, and there's, there's, you know, even though we don't really show that because we basically say it has to go back through the proposal state again, um, you know, which is a line that's somewhat missing here, I guess, if you will. But I think there's, you know, there's ways that even then this badging could potentially be simplified uh, to reflect, you know, and we won't have all these numbers and have to think very hard about this. I think the other piece of this that comes to mind is that there has been a lot of confusion for people who weren't involved in the original discussions about this life cycle, about what's the difference between dormant and deprecated and end of life? And what, you know, do I go, do I have to go to dormant before I go to deprecated? Do I have to go to deprecated before I go to end of life? Do, you know, what's, what is this certain um, life cycle that I could follow? And so I think that, uh, yeah, I like, I like the suggestion, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So, so Tracy, what, do you think we should then uh, uh, go back and uh, maybe make this uh, make a simpler project lifecycle diagram, and then uh, conduct the badges? Yeah, I do think that could uh, that should, that would work, Rama. Okay. Do you think we should uh, merge all these three into one, or do you think? Uh, Okay, uh, I mean, if if the end of life is just meant to be an, an archival state rather than a like a, a death state, then uh, yeah, we can probably merge them all. I mean, if, if end of life is meant to be something more drastic, then we can probably and this was I think my earlier thought was we can probably merge these two, dormant and deprecated. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that could be an option, and then um, I don't know, maybe end of life becomes yeah, I don't know. It's, you know, is there really a need for an end of life, I think, is the, the question. Or is it just everything is archived and then at some point, if somebody decides, you know what, I want to bring this back, then it would come back. I, I think yeah. it serves to remember what, you know, why we have added those, right? And so we had specific scenarios where we say, okay, now we're in, you know, where do, how do we capture this state? But I again, I think you can get re merge all of this, if you will, into one archived because all the other ones are kind of because we were afraid to call it end of life when people said, but I might come back like dormant, right? We had a specific case where somebody said, oh, I'm not going to be able to work on this for the next six months or a year. Just put us on the pause. And if you had archived, you can say, okay, no worries. We'll archive your project for now. And it, when you come back, we can easily unarchive it. So this is why I mean, I think the other cases become moot. We don't need those other states. 
I think yeah. we can address all the scenarios we address by adding those. By if we had first renamed end of life archived or deprecated archived, and you get rid of end of life, it all comes down to the same. The the graphic is going to get simplified in the same manner. I agree. Uh, okay. So, so Tracy, then you think we should, uh, that should be the next step then? Maybe uh, yep. combining, just propose the diagram, combining these three into one, and then create a much simpler diagram. Yeah, I think so. Thanks, thanks, Argo. Uh, okay, I had one more question. So I had some uh, listed some criteria for quality evaluation and uh, decisions for either issuing a bag or withdrawing a bag. Uh, so I thought uh, this could also be done using the PRs because we use PRs for so many other things. Uh, if we uh, if a, to acquire a bag, the project maintainers must submit a request to the POC via pull request. And the, only the POC may issue a bag by approving this kind of PR. Uh, and this is a question for everybody. And should we all vote for it as well as we do in the POC meeting? So, uh, any comments on, on these two? Everybody thinks that it's fine to uh, have a badge issuance process via PR. And second question, should we all vote on it as well or just uh, approve the PRs like we approved the uh, uh, quarterly report? Are there certain badges that we think can be automated from us? And is this? Yeah, is this some of them, just some for... of them can be. Yeah, some of them can be. If we if create an action to check for the presence of a particular file, and also a sort of cosmetic check to see whether it has something substantial. It's not a zero byte file. Yeah, some of them we cannot do, but not all. I mean, uh, we don't have to decide right now. I'll I'll keep this up here, and uh, can uh, you know, people can can think about it. Yeah, that's that's all the discussion points I had for now. Uh, I will uh, uh, again fix this document and then just submit a PR sometime very soon. Uh, so next week, of course, uh, we have. I think uh, we don't have a meeting for Thanksgiving, right? And uh, I will be away the following week as well. So I'll be back the first week of the term. That's, I think, uh, seven. Okay, anything else? Or I'll stop sharing. I think that's good. Okay. All right. Any other topics for today that anybody would like to discuss? No? Okay. Well, then we will see you again in two weeks uh, when we come back on the 30th. And I hope that those in the U.S. have a great holiday week and um, yeah, for everybody else, just a great couple of weeks before we meet again. All right, Bye. thanks everyone. Okay, thanks, Chris. Thank you. Bye.